All right, welcome everybody. Hello, um, We're welcoming uh, Tadeus Tonis today. So he'll be talking about his research on productivity adjusted life years lost due to type 2 diabetes in Germany. And he's an epidemiologist at the German Diabetes Center in Düsseldorf, and he recently obtained his PhD in public health. And his research focuses on methods for descriptive epidemiology using aggregated data and projections of future disease and economic burden of diabetes. So I'll let you take it away, Tadeus. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and also for um, the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to present uh, the paper that I've written with um, Annika Hoyer and Ralph Brinks on um, the economic burden of diabetes and uh, current economic burden and also future economic burden. Um, but uh, before I will go um, into the economic burden, I would like to um, talk a little bit about um, the disease burden that is imposed by diabetes um, globally to um, illustrate uh, the dimensions of um, or the dimension of uh, the diabetes epidemic. Um, the global burden of disease study estimates that um, 71 million disability adjusted life years are lost uh, globally due to type two diabetes. And this uh, measure of disability adjusted life years um, is a, a composed of two parts, namely um, the life years lost due to premature deaths related to type two diabetes, which means that um, this is the mortality burden that is quantified by this measure. And the second part is um, the morbidity part that, lives, uh, that causes um, disease burden, namely the, the life years lost due to um, diabetes related disability. And these numbers, um, the 71 million years lost, um, makes type two diabetes uh, rank eight in uh, the single causes of disease burden um, globally. And these large numbers um, made Paul Zimmet ask in 2017, Paul Zimmet is honorary uh, president of the International Diabetes Federation, whether diabetes and its drivers are the largest epidemic in human history. And in his uh, comment, uh, he comes to the conclusion that yes, diabetes is the greatest epidemic in human history. It has affected uh, the greatest numbers, the greatest costs, and most importantly, it is not over yet. And by it is not over yet, he refers to um, the projections um, done for the future number of people affected by uh, diabetes. And these are regularly performed by um, the IDF, the International Diabetes Federation. And here you can see uh, the results of this projection for different world regions. You can see that, for instance, um, in Europe, um, the increase uh, between 2019 and 2045 is uh, estimated to be about um, 15%, whereas in Africa, for example, um, the, uh, the number of um, people with diabetes is estimated to increase by um, 143%. So there's considerable uh, variation in these projections. And um, worldwide, this means that in 2045, it is estimated that 700 million people will be affected by diabetes, which um, is equivalent to a 51% increase in the number of cases compared to 2019. However, despite these large numbers, um, Paul Zimmet also states that they, uh, the WHO and the IDF, um, yeah, he states that somehow harshly, um, that they were terribly wrong because by 2015, there were already 450 million people with diabetes, far above what was predicted in 2000 for 30 years later. So he stated that in 2015, we already had more cases than they were projected for 2030. So within half the time. 
And of course, there are probably many reasons for these underestimations, but um, one important one um, from my point of view is um, that the method they used, um, the model they used for their projection um, could be a major reason for this underestimation. Because how this model they used essentially works is that they um, apply the currently observed age-specific prevalence to population projections of um, the United Nations. So they account for changes in age structure and population size, but not for changes in age-specific prevalence. And you can see this here uh, from um, the accompanying paper of the IDF Atlas with the, for the projection that the age standardized prevalence um, in these different uh, IDF regions essentially stays the same between 2017 and 2045. Um, and from many studies, uh, we know that this is actually not the case. So the age specific prevalence increases. And this is mainly due to the fact that um, the prevalence is a result of um, the dynamic interplay of different rates that determine how many people are currently affected by diabetes. And these dynamics can be illustrated in the so-called illness death model. And you can see that the illness death model um, divides the population in two proportions, in two parts, uh, in three parts, excuse me. So we have the uh, population with no diabetes, the population with diabetes, and um, people can die from both of these states. And the prevalence P depends on the one hand on the inflow, the incidence rate, and also on the outflow, the mortality rate, but also on the competing risk of the incidence rate, namely the, the mortality rate of people without diabetes. I will go into um, a little bit more detail later, but for now I would like to, um, to say that the future prevalence depends on the age-specific incidence, the mortality of people without diabetes, the mortality of people with diabetes, and its changes over time. And from this, you can see only if all those components cancel each other out so that the prevalence remains constant, then this uh, model from the IDF yields uh, valid results. So from my point of view, this is one major reason why these projections were so low compared to what actually happened. Um, of course, the advantage of this method is that you only need prevalence data. And if you do this globally, um, it is of course difficult to, to obtain valid data for the incidence or at least more difficult than for prevalence data, which is uh, far more often available for, for many countries uh, in the world. So, it's probably a trade-off if you want to do these projections globally. Um, however, we applied this model for Germany in order to, um, to make a projection of uh, the number of cases. And we found out that um, this somehow difficult assumption of age-specific prevalence has a, a, quite an impact on the results. So for instance, if we assume this model for, for um, with uh, constant age-specific prevalence, we estimated that in 2040, there will be 8.3 million people with type 2 diabetes in Germany. If we use the illness death model, even if we assume that the incidence rate remains constant, there are already 11 million people um, with type 2 diabetes uh, in 2040 in Germany. And this is mainly due to the fact that the mortality rates will decrease in future as they have for um, yeah, many, many decades in the past. And every projection say that this will uh, go on. And if people live longer with diabetes and without diabetes, there will be more people in the diabetes state. So mortality has a huge impact here. Um, so from these disease burden, I would like to um, 
come to the topic of type 2 diabetes and productivity because besides um, the disease burden, the disability burden that is estimated in the global burden of disease study, diabetes is also associated with um, an impact on productivity. Um, on the one hand, of course, higher mortality among people with type 2 diabetes also causes productivity losses because everyone who dies before um, uh, or during working age cannot be uh, productive in, uh, anymore. Um, but people with diabetes also have a reduced uh, probability to participate in labor force. Um, they have on average more absence days um, than people without diabetes and even at work, they have a reduced productivity. The last two aspects are also known as absenteeism and presenteeism. So similar to um, the disease burden of diabetes, we have these uh, mortality component of productivity burden and the mobility component of um, productivity burden associated with type two diabetes. And um, in addition to the substantial increase that can be expected in the number of diabetes cases, um, this um, topic gains um, additional importance if we look at accompanying demographic trends. Um, here you can see a um, color-coded map of Europe where these more red and yellow colors indicate um, a decrease in the population in working age. So if you see the color code here, this dark orange means that between 2020 and 2030, um, the number of people in working age will decrease by 20%. And this decreasing number of people in working age in some regions in Europe is accompanied, of course, by an increasing number of people in retirement age. So if we have more people with diabetes, with, which is associated with productivity loss, and at the same time, a decreasing number of people who are in a productive working age, these two trends, the demographic and the epidemiological trend, may aggravate each other. And this can result in the problem that um, the welfare systems for people in retirement age mainly depend on people in working age to um, deliver the productivity so that they can maintain the welfare state for people who are not working anymore. And you can see here um, this region with a lot of yellow and orange um, parts, that is Germany. And you can see in the European um, comparison that Germany is particularly affected by these um, decreasing number of people in working age. And these uh, trends can also be described quantitatively um, using the dependency ratio. Um, the dependency ratio quantifies um, the ratio of people in retirement age in relation to people in uh, working age. So I would like to focus on the old age dependency ratio, which is this line. And you can see that in 2020, for um, 100 people in working age, there are 37 people above working age or in retirement age. And this ratio will increase to 54 in 2040. So in 2040, for 100 people who are in working age, there will already be 54 people who are in retirement age. And this is, of course, a strong increase. And um, again, the increase in the number of cases of type 2 diabetes may be an additional problem here. So the aim of, of our study was um, to estimate the productivity loss associated with type 2 diabetes in Germany between 2020 and 2040. And this was for on the one hand done on the individual level. So we estimated um, 
years of life lost due to excess mortality associated with type 2 diabetes and the three morbidity components um, reduced labor force to participation, absentism, and presentism. And the sum of these both measures um, yielded the productivity adjusted life years or short PALI. And also on the population level, um, we estimated the sum of all individual parties, which means um, simply the number of people affected by diabetes multiplied with these um, age-dependent um, PALI measure. And in order to have the number of people with diabetes available in 2040, we needed to project the prevalence of diabetes. And here we used, again, our illness death model, um, which I will describe in a little bit more detail this time. Um, so I indicates the incidence rate of type 2 diabetes, and M0 and a one the mortality rates of people without and with type 2 diabetes. And prevalence, the uh, parameter of interest in, in our case, is indicated by P. And all of these measures uh, depend on two time scales, namely the calendar time T and HA. And this whole system can be described by a partial differential equation, which you can see here. So this stylized um, D indicates um, the temporal change in prevalence, P. The temporal change in, with regard to the two time scales, calendar time and age. And you can see that this change in prevalence depends on all the rates in the illness death model and the starting prevalence, P. And since M0 is um, they are hardly available, so there are only very few studies who, which estimate uh, the mortality rate of people without diabetes, which is uh, what is more, uh, much more available is um, the mortality rate ratio. So the ratio of the mortality rate from people with diabetes compared to people without diabetes. So we use this equation here, which is mathematically equivalent to this one, and um, incorporates the mortality rate ratio and the mortality of the general population, which is uh, readily available from um, population projections in the case of Germany uh, from the um, Federal Statistical Office. And we yield the prevalence with this equation by, by solving it um, by integration. So differential equation describes the change in prevalence. If we integrate the change, we yield um, the prevalence. And we, we do that by using input data for the right-hand side of the equation. So we need an age-specific starting value for the prevalence P at the beginning of the projection period. Then we need age-specific incidence rate mortality of the general population and mortality rate ratio for all time points between the beginning and the end of the projection period. And if we do that and integrate um, this equation, we yield the age-specific prevalence for all time points during the projection period. And finally, applying this projected prevalence to population projections of the Federal Statistical Office yields the number of people with type 2 diabetes. Um, now we uh, come to um, how we calculated uh, these components of, of PALI. Uh, first, we defined um, the years of life lost associated with type 2 diabetes as uh, the difference in life expectancy of a person with versus without type 2 diabetes up to age 69 years. Choose 69 years is our cutoff age for um, the working age. And I would like to note here that this measure is very different uh, conceptually and also from the results um, than the measure from the Global Burden of Disease Study. The Global Burden of Disease Study uses um, causes of death statistics, so it counts the number of deaths that had type 2 diabetes in the death certificate and multiplies these number of um, deaths with the remaining life expectancy, the age of death. 
And here we, our measure compares a person with type 2 diabetes and without type 2 diabetes, so with prevalent um, type 2 diabetes, and calculates the, their difference in remaining life expectancy. So our, our measure refers to a living person with type 2 diabetes and not to a death that occurred in a given year. Um, then YPL, so years of productivity loss, um, contained three parts. Um, one for um, the difference in labor force participation. I indicated this here with um, the Greek Delta. So Delta LFP indicates the difference in labor force participation um, between people with and without type two diabetes. And the second part is um, the presentism and absentism part. And by this, uh, this was calculated by rating the remaining lifetime until age 69. Um, with a so-called productivity loss rate. So by remaining lifetime, I mean lifetime that was neither lost due to mortality and not, nor lost due to um, difference in labor force participation. But even in that case, people with type 2 diabetes experience productivity loss by a certain amount. And this amount was quantified by the productivity loss rate, which ranges between zero and one. If it is zero, there's no productivity loss. And if it is one, the whole lifetime is in terms of productivity is lost. So this is somehow equivalent to the um, disability rate where it's used in the global burden of disease study to estimate um, the disability burden due to disease. And then I will try to give a little bit more of intuition of these uh, measures. Um, I, I try to illustrate it uh, in terms of um, survival curves. So here you can see, um, so not real or estimated survival curves, it's just a, a figure I draw by hand, so, um, or with PowerPoint. So here you can see two survival curves. Uh, the solid line refers to people without type 2 diabetes and the dashed line to people with type 2 diabetes. And Given that we compared two persons uh, at the same age, A0, over their life course, uh, over age A, and the survival probability independence of age A, um, we can, for instance, um, say that this difference in the survival curves is the difference due to um, increased mortality associated with type 2 diabetes. And I can calculate, for instance, at age 40, this difference by the difference of the survival probability for people without type 2 diabetes minus the survival probability people with type 2 diabetes. This is exactly this part uh, um, in this curve, or the difference between this curve at this time point at age 40. Then we have another part here indicated by blue color. And this is the part that is lost due to difference in labor force participation. So you can see if the person with type 2 diabetes survives with a certain probability until age 40, there's a certain amount that is lost due to difference in labor force participation. And I can calculate that by multiplying this difference with the survival probability. And the third part, which is um, the part that remains from uh, year 40, at age 40, um, that is the part that is not lost due to mortality and not lost due to difference in labor force participation, but which is then downweighted by the productivity loss rate at age 40. And I can do that for every year until I um, cover the whole age range. And then these formulas here um, become integrals that we refer to the respective areas under these survival curves. So the difference in life expectancy is the difference 
in these survival curves referring to this gray area. So this is the difference in life expectancy at age A0 of a person with compared to a person without type 2 diabetes. And similarly, this blue area is the area that is lost due to um, difference in labor force participation. And the yellow area is downrated each year by this productivity loss rate. And the sum of all of these measures yield um, the productivity adjusted life years for a person at that age with type 2 diabetes compared to the same person without type 2 diabetes same aged person without type 2 diabetes. So putting it all together, the interpretation is um, partly is the potential gain in productive life years of a person with type 2 diabetes during their remaining working life if mortality, labor force participation, presentism and absentism were equal to people without type 2 diabetes. Um, we estimated this measure for um, the population in Germany in working age defined um, as 20 to 69 years between the years 2020 and 2040. And this requires a projection up to the year 2089 in order to estimate this party measure for person aged 20 years in 2040 because we have to project the rates and the survival until the age of 69 years. And we started our projection uh, due to the data availability in the year 2015, but um, I will report results for 2020 and 2040. Um, we had to make, of course, we are looking to the future, we had to make uh, many assumptions and use different input data to, to feed the model. Um, the general mortality was drawn from um, the Federal Statistical Office, and we assumed that it will decrease um, over time as it was uh, estimated or assumed by uh, the Federal Statistical Office in their population projections. And um, the mortality rate ratio associated with type 2 diabetes stems from the National Diabetes Surveillance. This is mainly drawn from um, claims data, um, which comprises data from 70 million people in German statutory, statutory health insurance. Um, and we assume that this mortality rate ratio decreases over time, uh, according to a, a Danish uh, study by Carstens and et al. We have no German data available on these MRR trends. Um, the incidence rate was also uh, from the same uh, database from the National Diabetes Surveillance, and we assume that it will remain constant over the projection period. And the productivity measures um, associated with type 2 diabetes were mainly drawn from a systematic review. And uh, these range for the difference in labor force participation between 7% and 75% depending on age and sex. So people with type 2 diabetes are seven, between 7% and 25% less likely to participate in labor force. Um, they have on average 1.3, between 1.3 and 1.4 more absence days per year. And at work, they are on average between 0.4 and 0.5% less productive than people with out type 2 diabetes. And we assume that this measure will not change over time. So here we come um, to the results for the individual level. We see here the results for women um, in 2020 over age. And we can see that at age 20, um, a woman in Germany is expected to approximately lose 30, uh, 13 um, productive life years during their, her remaining working life. And with increasing age, um, of course, these absolute number of productivity loss uh, decreases because um, there's, not, there's less time left until age 69. 
if we look at the year 2040 for women, we see that results are mainly unchanged, uh, only um, the YLL, so the years of life lost, the mortality component decreases a little bit because we assume that the mortality rate ratio will uh, decrease over time. Among men, we see also only slight differences between 2020 and 2040, but we can see um, overall much less um, productive life years lost, uh, which is mainly due to the fact that the difference in labor force participation was um, higher among women than among men in this uh, systematic review we used for uh, the model. So we can summarize by saying that more parties are lost among women and over time there are almost no changes on the individual level. Um, then we looked at how the two different components, years of life loss and years of productivity loss, um, contribute to a uh, poly. And you can sort of see that on this figure that the YPL component is, is much higher than the YLL component. And here we can see the relative contribution. And we see that among women in 2020, um, YLL approximately contributes 15% to these uh, productivity adjusted life years loss and this um, relative contribution decreases in 2040. And among men, we see that the mortality company contributes relatively, uh, on the relative scale contributes more to um, the Pali measure. Um, we also wanted to know uh, what uh, the relative impact of type 2 diabetes on productivity is. So we looked at how the relative difference between people with and without type 2 diabetes is and over age. And here we can see that it is relatively constant over age among women. This means that um, women um, with type 2 diabetes approximately uh, have 20% less productive life year or fewer productive life years than uh, P, uh, women uh, without type 2 diabetes. And similarly to the absolute poly results, um, men experience uh, a little bit less uh, relative loss in productive life years. Uh, so these individual level results um, uh, were now summarized uh, for the population level. So we, at each age group, we calculated the number of people with diabetes and multiplied it with these age-specific results for YLL, PALI, and YPL. And this resulted in 2020 in uh, 4.6 million people in working age with type 2 diabetes. Um, which uh, who are expected to lose 12.1 billion um, productivity adjusted life years during their remaining um, working life. And for 2040, we see that 5.5 million people with type 2 diabetes are expected to lose 15.4 billion parties over their remaining working life. And this increase is mainly caused by this increase in the number of people because we saw on the individual level the results greatly changed over time. So to conclude, we can say that um, the productivity adjusted life is lost per person with type 2 diabetes approx is approximately 2.6 years in Germany in 2020 and almost the same in 2040. Uh, but that on the population level, um, that this, uh, this number will increase substantially due to the increase in the number of people affected by type 2 diabetes. And some studies show that um, these productivity losses are more pronounced or associated with glucose control and complications. So the individual level results are focus or lay focus on the usual measures to optimize um, the clinical course of type 2 diabetes. Um, that will also um, perhaps 
um, lower the impact on productivity. But um, the population level results um, lay the focus on, on the primary prevention by uh, aiming to lower the type 2 diabetes incidence rate because these increase that we projected is mainly caused by the future number of people in, uh, with type 2 diabetes. And this is largely driven by future trends of the incidence rate. Um, I would like to close with um, some points to consider when interpreting our results. So some weaknesses of our study. Um, first of all, our model does not account for the impact of migration. So if people who migrate to Germany have a largely different prevalence than the people who are already living in Germany, this might impact our results. However, in previous studies, we show that the, um, the amount of migration to Germany will generally not change uh, the general conclusions of, of these projections. Um, what is more important is uh, the quality of the input data. Um, of course, these projections always heavily depend on what you put in these models and the quality of the data you have to use for these models. And we were not able to use data um, that was differentiated by diabetes type for all input uh, values that we needed. Um, and not all input data came from Germany. So there's simply, for instance, we use dense data for the MRR because we simply have no data on the MRR trends in Germany. And of course, these predictions also depend on the many assumptions that we have to make for the projections. Um, it is, of course, a very long period to project these rates until 2089. So this requires particularly strong assumptions. And it is always questionable if these assumptions, uh, assumptions hold. And any projection in this regard is somehow speculative in nature. But it provides maybe so-called what-if scenarios. So if all these assumptions hold, this is approximately what will happen. But as always, um, looking into the future is uh, always difficult and always a lot of uncertainty that no one have to, has to uh, bear in mind when interpreting these results. Yeah, with this, I would like um, to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, also, uh, I would like to thank once again, Annika Hoyer and Ralph Brings, uh, the co-authors of this study. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward for uh, to the discussion and some questions. Great, thank you, Tadeus. And then just for everybody's reference, I included some links in the chat in case you wanted to look at Tadeus's paper from 2021, as well as the Global Burden of Disease uh, summary of the data on diabetes from the Institute of Health, Health Metrics and Evaluation. So um, that might interest you as well. Um, without further ado, if we have any questions, feel free to either put your question in the chat, introduce yourself, where you're coming from, um, and I can also start off with one question while everybody is thinking about some. Um, so one thing you mentioned, Tadeus, was that you um, that you would maybe have some difficulty in differentiating between types of diabetes in the data. Were there any ways that you try to you know, compensate for that, like um, taking into account the prevalence of type one versus type two diabetes and maybe differences in incidence. I, I did know that you, you assumed that there would not be any changes of incidence in type two diabetes over the time course, right? So. Yeah. Um, um, the thing is that we actually, we used published data, so we had no um, access to the individual data. So we had to, to take what was published. And in some cases, for instance, uh, for the incidence rate, this was um, unfortunately only um, all diabetes types. However, um, there are studies using the same data that differentiate by type. So it is 
uh, potentially possible and for the prevalence data for 2015 um, uses very similar data and they differentiate it by diabetes type. So it is possible, but it depends on what uh, the National Diabetes Surveillance reports in this regard. And uh, the access to the data is um, Germany is somehow difficult. So that's why we um, yeah, have somehow re to rely on this published aggregated data. And um, yeah, that's of course a limitation. However, in, with regard to the incidence rate, I think the impact is not so big because we only um, look at the age range from 20 to 69 years and there are, it is, I mean, type two diabetes is already 90% of cases and in that end of age range, it's probably even more because the incidence rate is, I think, highest at age, I don't know, 10, 15 for type one diabetes. I'm not totally sure, but I think that most of cases of type one diabetes occur before the age of 20. So I think in terms of the incidence rate, it's not that much of an impact with regard to the mortality rate ratio. I'm not so sure whether the mortality rate ratio for people with type one versus type two diabetes is much worse or much better. I'm not so sure about that. But yeah, of course, it would be uh, preferable if these data were reported differentiated by type. Yeah, thanks for addressing that question really thoroughly and taking information from a data set from, uh, from insurance data or electronic health record data can present some, some complications like that. All right. Yeah, yeah go for it, Omar. Hi, Tadeusz. Uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. I really like the, <laughs> your figure with the colors because that helped me understand the relative contribution of uh, each of the measures. A uh, very nice paper also. Uh, I was wondering if you have any hy hypothesis to explain the, the large differences between men and women to hold their age span. Um, um, uh, so just from the numbers, I know that this difference is because of the difference in labor force participation. So the numbers from the systematic review says um, the impact of type 2 diabetes on labor force participation is much stronger among women than among men. Um, why that is the case, I don't know. Maybe because, uh, I don't know, if both are ill, it is more likely that the women won't take part in labor force. I, I, I don't elaborate on that. Um, I'm, but in general, I think there are some studies that say that the clinical cause of type 2 diabetes is somehow worse among women. So maybe that is the case, or it could also be that because uh, the mortality is lower than among men, that maybe this re somehow reflects in the fact that um, they instead have a lower or a larger impact regarding the labor force participation. But these are just speculation, so I didn't, didn't look into detail in, in these sex differences. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was looking for this speculation <laughs> answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's very interesting with, the, with this part of type 1 diabetes, because the largest differences uh, were observed at younger ages and it decreases with age, right? But uh, but I was curious to hear something about how uh, how this misclassification of of type one diabetes could uh, bias uh, the estimates, mm -hmm. in particular at the beginning of the uh, at the youngest uh, ages. But you covered yeah. some of it. Thank you, Tadeusz again. All right, we have a question from Harold. Um, so he says, congratulations for the presentation. Which would be the impact of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 pandemic on these estimations, if you could project 
<laughs> uh, I don't know really. So, um, I think there are a lot. There are some papers on how um, these two pandemics or epidemics interact, or syndemics uh, somehow called nowadays. So, I think it will change a lot. Um, but I can't say in, in which direction. Um, I mean, I heard that I just uh, today read a paper or, or an abstract, maybe, um, which says that in, I think it was a study from the US that, um, that overweight and obesity during these lockdown measures already increased uh, among children. And because if uh, schools are closed or uh, and so uh, children just don't uh, have uh, much lower physical activity. So this could be one thing that impacts uh, how the future incidence of diabetes will, um, uh, will develop. Uh, of course, we know that people with type two diabetes are at a much higher probability to um, have a, a severe cause of, of COVID-19 if they are infected. Um, so this may be, I don't know if it's possible to see that on the population level because the population level, depending on which country you're looking at, the numbers um, affected by COVID-19 uh, are very different. And if you can see maybe an increase in the mortality rate of people with type two diabetes, think for at least in Germany, we have to wait several years to, 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 get, to get this this data. But maybe this would be one trend that the mortality will increase among people with type two diabetes on a population level, always depending on how many um, people were infected. But also, of course, um, the care for people with diabetes probably suffered a lot or for all chronic diseases, uh, or for all diseases which are not COVID-19 uh, suffered uh, during these times because uh, I know that for Germany um, the incidence or the, um, the number of uh, people in hospitals with uh, miracle infarction or cancer diagnosis decreased because um, all resources or many of the resources were shifted uh, to, uh, to care for these uh, pandemic situation. And this is probably not because these people were healthier all of a sudden, but because they were, were not diagnosed. So um, this will definitely show in the administrative data, I think. If we look at the claims data and see a reduction in the incidence in this year, this is probably not a real reduction in the incidence, but a, a reduction in the diagnosis. Just to note really quick before Omar asks a question, I put a paper in the chat. It's a recent review paper. It came out last month in The Lancet on, and that includes some information on statistics in Germany and the UK and, and including um, like the potential effects of lockdown itself during COVID-19 pandemic um, on uh, diabetes rates. And a lot of them say, you know, tentatively, there might be small increases or no change, but depends when the paper was published and the setting. All right, go for it, Omar. Yes, just as a follow up to this uh, comment, I will speculate, as you said, Tadeus, uh, that probably the contribution of the year's life lost will be uh, higher compared to the to to, to the current results, don't you think? Because that will increase the, the um, how to call the, yeah, the part that is due to uh, to that, right? If the death rates uh, increase, that's it. Yeah, of course. If if we can see maybe that, perhaps not only for diabetes but for many diseases, um, that the disease-specific mortality increases because um, control of the disease was worse during uh, the pandemic, um, then perhaps one could see that uh, in the diabetic population. I think so too, so. Yeah. 
maybe uh, disregarded will have an impact. Yeah. yeah, but hopefully it will not. Yeah, keep on having an an impact over over time. Um, I guess I hope we all hope that things will stabilize at at, at some point. Um, yeah, I would just also like to say that the yeah I, I really kind of enjoyed your explanation of these different measures. I think you did a really good job of that. Um, and and I think you have a really important message that I yeah I didn't think so much uh, before this talk about. Um, where you say at one of the lot, the biggest impacts, right? That's the incidence of type two diabetes. And you really kind of highlight that prevention that's really, really important in this. And, uh, and yes, you are working with projections far out into the future and there's, there's many assumptions, but I guess like it's, it's uh, a lot better than sitting and think maybe it will be better, maybe it will be worse. I think this still gives a good information for people who actually have to make some decisions. So I think there's a lot of value in this. Um, but I was wondering, what do you see if kind of the, the key assumptions like in your projections and also what about uncertainty in the projections, right? Did you, did you do some sensitivity analysis for, for this? I'm just wondering like, yeah, so you talked about the, we talked about the type one, type two diabetes case, but there's other things that could kind of impact these projections and maybe some things more than others. Yeah. Um, as you already mentioned, um, the largest impact probably is uh, the future trends in the incidence rate. And um, there's at least in Germany also um, the largest uncertainty because we have no data on the incidence trend for I don't know, yeah, actually on this level that the data that we used here, it's only for a few years away available that we have for all these age groups detailed uh, or uh, these, these, these large databases available. Um, in other countries, it's much better, but um, I think the incidence, the uncertainty in the incidence is very important. Um, mortality, I think, is less problematic because many countries, or at least Germany, we actually have trends for 200 years due to official population statistics. So the, uh, the general mortality in Germany is very well known for for many many years and we can extrapolate that of course it's also an extrapolation and an assumption but we have much more data on that and i feel much more certain about uh, these how these trends will continue and i rely on uh, the expertise of the federal statistical office in this regard um, but i think the incidence rate is also much more um, variable so i think it, it uh, heavily depends on, on what will happen in the future. So I think we, we are very good at, or in the, in the recent decades, we were very good in preventing or getting better and preventing complications of diabetes, uh, improving survival of people with diabetes. But with regard to incidents, um, not much happened. So. I read a systematic review in the British Medical Journal uh, recently, which says in some high income countries, there seems to be a plateau of the incidence rate, maybe even a decrease, but not very convincing. So it could also be that it will go up again. So I think this will be very important how we, um, how we uh, address this issue on a population level. So I think nowadays, because we know the data is more um, accessible and more available, we look at the individual level when pre trying to prevent diabetes, but I think we, uh, we need uh, a lot of things done on the population level, for, like political interventions. I think this is the part that is mainly missing and it's probably also the part that is 
uh, much harder to, um, to address scientifically you know, because all of these concerns about causality are much more uh, much easier to address in randomized controlled trials than on uh, on a political level, I guess. So. Yeah, but hopefully your uh, some of your data maybe can knock a few <laughs> doors down, right? And uh, and and say that maybe this is something we need to do something more about than we are doing right now. And I also like see so. more people push push for this. That yeah, like maybe maybe we won't don't have the perfect evidence for like okay, so there are these di- big diabetes prevention trials that show that it is possible but we probably won't have that for like all different types of interventions and, and maybe politicians, they have to actually do something and then evaluate what you are doing and see, does it work on or, or not? And, and maybe that's also a route to, to go. So kind of, uh, yeah, twisting it around to doing something, see if it works or not, rather than waiting for the, for the perfect uh, evidence. Yeah. yeah, but thank you and a good answer. Are there any other questions? Just one thing I wanted to highlight. One of the things that most stood out uh, from one of your earlier slides, looking at the incidence of type 2 diabetes in different continents around the world or different regions um, from, I believe, the IDF, is you highlighted that um, Africa, like um, uh, other than North Africa, um, has such a relatively high uh, projected incidence of type 2 diabetes, somewhere over 100%. And one thing that that made me think of is uh, one of our co-organizers, Camille, uh, back in 2019, wrote a review on the economic impact of diabetes in Africa. So I put that in the chat. That might interest uh, you all. Any other points or comments from anybody, including you? Yeah, maybe just one thing for the last question about the uncertainty. We also did some sensitivity analysis uh, regarding the incidence rate. So we looked at what happened if happens if the incidence rate decreases or increases. And you can see, of course, that this impacts the number of people with type 2 diabetes, even if we only assume small decreases or increases. Um, substantially so it is possible to change it that's maybe one good message in the end all right thank you so much for joining us this was a very interesting paper that you've reviewed and you provide such a thorough uh, thorough review of all the different types of analyses that you did uh, so thanks so much and 